Hello everyone. My name is Kalidas Cherulil, the club growth director for District 4 for this year. As you know, today we have a webinar on rebuilding corporate clubs. And the presenter knows what she's going to talk about. Her name is Mar Repeto, known to many of you over the years. She has been with Toastmasters for the last 25 years. And over the last 25 years, she actually has worked with multiple clubs in different roles. And she also brought two clubs from the brink of death to 40 plus members. In one case, she actually went over 50 members twice with one of those clubs. So she knows what she's going to talk about. Mad is also the club coach chair for this year. So after the webinar, if you have any questions about rebuilding corporate clubs or about club coaching, now you know whom to reach out to. You can reach out to her or reach out to me. I can direct you to Matt or I can assist you with it. Over to you, Matt. Thank you for that introduction. And I want to thank everyone that has joined. I want you to know that I'm still working through the communicating on video manual. So I've decided to just show my slide deck instead of my face. Um, Kalidas had said, maybe it'd be good so that you know who you're, who everyone's talking to. So here's a picture of my family. I'm the Asian person. Um, I have my daughter Shireen on one side and my husband Eugenio in the middle. And then my husband and two kids and my, my pet buddy. Uh, you'll notice that in the middle picture, um, we're holding up a ribbon because my husband, after 15 years, has joined Daily City Toastmasters. So shout out to Daily City Toastmasters. And he won the best speaker for his icebreaker, and I, I happen to be there, and I won best evaluator. There's no point in me sharing that other than I love Toastmasters, and it's pretty much a part of my life and now part of my husband's life. Um, before, as I thought about what I wanted to share, I think... I'm going to try to tell you a story. So my first club was Visa Toastmasters. I was temping there, and my manager had told me that if I wanted to be hired full-time, that I needed to join Toastmasters. So I did. I joined Toastmasters, and the next day, I was vice president of education. Now, I didn't want to be vice president of education, but that club was unique in that there were seven members and all seven members had been officer board officers for several iterations, and they were burnt out. So um, being very determined to get hired at Visa, I decided I wanted to be the best vice president possible. So I went and I took every officer training. I took all seven because I needed to understand what op each officer role was, what the responsibilities were, and where did I fit into that. So my goal when I was Vice President of Education was not to rebuild the club. My goal was just to be the best Vice President of Education that I could be. And in that process of trying to do my job, I, I, I stumbled on the secret formula, which I think is what makes strong clubs. So everything I learned in Visa <laughs> excuse me, I implemented at Genentech Toastmasters and we saw the same kind of growth. So I think that there is a recipe, if you will, that, that works for rebuilding corporate clubs. The first thing that I want to say is that we're all on the same common ground, meaning that every Toastmaster is a learner. And we all come into Toastmasters, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes we're told that we have to join, but we are all learning. And we all come with our own issue that we want to fix or a skill that we want to refine. And I think that that is something that is the glue that gives us all the same sort of common ground to have a conversation. So. I believe the reason why Visa Toastmasters and Genentech Toastmasters did really well 
is we created a culture, a culture of servant leadership and of safety. So I have noticed that sometimes in some clubs, the officer board uh, almost becomes a company, which makes sense because Toastmasters was developed so that we can all learn how to run a big corporation. But the unique thing about Toastmasters is that we're all volunteers. And really, we're all servant leaders. We are here to serve the membership. And so if we just focus on our members and making sure that they get what they want or they thought they were going to get out of Toastmasters and we create a culture and an environment where everyone is has the ability to participate, everyone is encouraged, and people will begin to thrive. And when people thrive, they tend to want to stay where, where they're happy. I think a key part of culture is the officer board. So sometimes, depending on where your club is, you know, your club may just need a little bit of growth or your club has to completely rebuild, you may encounter officers that are burnt out, meaning they've been officers several times. For whatever reason, the, the club will grow and maybe due to attrition or unexpected reorganization, the club will re reduce size. We're seeing a lot of that happening right now. And so the officer board is really important. What I learned from Visa was I was just one new officer. Everyone had been there and been officers several times before me and the fresh blood and the fresh perspective and the fresh enthusiasm really allowed the current officer board to, to be re-energized. So it doesn't mean that the current officers should still stay officers. I think what's a great mix is if you have current members and then new members being officers because then you have some of the traditions of the past and then you have fresh eyes and fresh energy to really look towards the future. Now, I want to talk about why it's important to have 100% officer training. So I believe that if every officer is trained and not just the minimum four to get your DCP point, it sets a tone. It says that we take this seriously, that we're here to lead and we're here to serve the community. Now, it also, when every officer takes officer training, they should understand their role and understand how they are together a team. And if everyone does officer training, then everyone's on the same commitment level, meaning you don't have any resentment that, okay, six of us went and one did not go. It, it sets the tone, it creates a culture, and it maintains the culture to have an officer board that's committed to go to having 100% officer trained. So I think that that's the first sort of check mark that needs to happen. Every officer, so both at Visa and then Genentech when I was president twice, both are, uh, so for Visa, I was the one that went to all the officer training. But m moving forward, I kind of encourage that all of our officers go to the same training if possible so that we can bond together. And if that wasn't possible due to locations, that we at least all went to officer training so that we all felt like we were all equally committed. And that's, that's really important. The other tone that I want to take is that really we are a volunteer organization. So despite whatever level you are at the club or the district even, we're all volunteers. No one gets paid. We stay because we want to. We participate because we want to. And really, no one wants another job and, and another job that doesn't pay anything. So what we're really developing is servant leadership and teaching ourselves how to be influential leaders because we have no real authority over anyone. And we do that, we do that influencing by creating a culture of recognition and inclusion and really the mindset that I, I try to instill in, in my officers was that we're learning how to make friends and be better friends. So we all have different social 
styles and skills, but ultimately we want to be friends with everyone in the board and also in our club. I have found that organizations only grow to the level of the leader skill. So to grow the club, and if you're leading that club, then you actually have to grow your leadership skills. And that's what happened to me. I was not expecting to be a leader. People were looking to me to be a leader. So how did I grow my leadership skill? Well, I practiced leading, meaning I did my job as a vice president of education. I backed up the president when he wasn't available. We all tried to work together as officers and we made decisions, implemented them, and took responsibility for them. And that's really what leading is about, is being accountable. Um, the one thing I think is that it's okay to make mistakes. So sometimes I see seasoned officers expecting things to be a certain way with new officers. And so they're very demanding in their standards. And so what I want to say is that it's okay to make mistakes and once the membership understands your commitment to them, they're going to have a lot of grace and be committed back to you. And I have found that there's actually no perfect leader, only perfect commitment. Meaning that we can have all the best intentions, we can put all the structures in place, and then human beings are human beings and things happen. But when people understand your commitment, they can forgive those mistakes. And so we are a leadership growing organization. That means that the only way we could lead is to practice leading. And for some of us, that is first time leaders that we, um, some, some of us that are first time leaders, we're going to make mistakes and we need to have the grace to do that. The other thing I want to talk about is that expect to have breakdowns, meaning if your club is at seven members and now you have 14, well, your, your officer board and your club is used to operating with seven members. Now they're operating with 14 members. That means, you know, new ways of communicating might need to be developed, new ways of scheduling might need to be developed. So just expect that as your club grows, there's going to be growth pains, and that's just normal. So as long as you people don't freak out and say, oh, the club is falling apart, and, they, and the mindset is it's expected, wow, every time we have a growing pain, that means that we're growing, and that's what we want. It kind of chills everything down and makes everything more comfortable. I love this picture of Humphrey Bogart, and I have the, uh, discovered the term no board guarding. So basically what that means is share the leadership. You know, it's, it's really easy for one person to do everything. I know because I was the one person that did everything. So when I was vice president of education, you can imagine that with seven members, not all seven members showed up to do their roles. So I learned to be Toastmaster, Table Topics Master, General Evaluator, and even Evaluator, and sometimes Timer at the same meeting. What that does is it builds a skill set of the meeting's going to happen no matter what and I'm going to make it happen. When you have that mindset and you have consistent meetings that happen whether you have two members show up or 20 members show up or 50 members show up, you know that the meeting's going to happen. I'm sorry, I hear some uh, clanging in the background. So when you, when you know that uh, the meetings are going to happen, it's that consistency that people are expecting, that's when members start showing up. The worst thing that can happen is that, let's say you meet every Saturday at 9 o'clock, and then you realize not enough people are going to show up, so you cancel at the last minute. Well, then members will start to feel that they're not going to be able to rely whether there's going to be a meeting or not. So if there's a casualness to when the meetings occur, there's going to be a casualness to whether or not members keep their commitments. So one of the things about my rule of no bow guarding is whoever wants to step into leadership, let them step into leadership and then help, help them find their wings. So even if, now I have some 
guidelines on how, when someone should be Toastmaster. But if you have a brand new member and they want to be Toastmaster and they haven't even given their first speech, let them be Toastmaster and just guide them through the process. One of the things that I think is key is not to curb enthusiasm. Hmm. Do you like this slide? I saw it and I thought I had to put it in my presentation. What's your programming? What's the code behind your culture of your meetings? Meaning, the key to member retention is knowing the, your membership and knowing their goals. So you want to follow the Toastmasters process. Um, what I have found, especially with specialty clubs, is that if you follow the Toastmasters process, there's actually input that comes in, which is a new member. They follow the Toastmaster educational process. And at the end of that process, you have a competent or competent Toastmasters. If you, in another way of saying it, um, a cherry tree will bear cherries and not apples. So however your club, it, the club culture is, how you do your scheduling, the tone of your club, that's the kind of member that you're going to develop. That's the kind of Toastmaster you're going to develop. So if your club is, has high accountability, has um, leaders that are willing to mentor and be selfless in how they support the membership, the members that come out of your club will be the same, same type of leaders, the same type of Toastmasters. So why follow the process? Well, I love the process, the Toastmasters process is because it's already a system that's in place. It's been around since I believe 1920 or so. And um, you can refer questions to Toastmasters International. So you don't personally have to hand sit with your new members or even current members with any Toastmasters questions. You could just refer them to TI, give them a number, and they, and they answer pretty quickly. The Toastmaster educational system works. Again, an apple will bear apple, apple tree. A good Toastmasters club will, will develop strong Toastmasters that are skilled as leaders and as communicators. When people deviate from the Toastmasters process, that's, that's when um, we start having problems. What that means is that you can get a quick win so, for example, I don't feel like we need to schedule ahead. Everybody here is busy. Everybody needs to self-schedule. So that might be okay for the current membership. But then you're going to have problems down the road because um, you don't have a schedule in place. Now there's confusion. So if you follow the Toastmasters best practices, you can pretty much guarantee the kind of Toastmasters that's going to come out of that club. So if you look at clubs that are struggling, I bet you some of them are not following either the Toastmasters educational format or they're deviating somehow, like they don't participate at the district level, they don't hold contests. There's, I can almost say that any club that's having problems is because they don't follow the Toastmasters process the way it's defined. Now, I do have some recommended practices um, that I, I see has, has worked in, 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 the, in the three times that I, we've, I've been participating in growing an organization. One is that we, we consistently had a membership questionnaire. Um, when I was VPE, that was something that I, I did, and it worked very well. I wanted to know how often could members come to meetings, what were their educational goals, were they interested in being an officer down the road, and then we would check in with them at the end of the year to see that their goals were met. And then I would do the scheduling around what they said in their questionnaire. We also kept track of where members were in their educational goals. So at any moment, if, if, if someone was at, you know, I'm talking about the legacy system, 
if someone had 10 speeches and they only needed to do two more to get their CC, then I would talk to them and, and schedule them for that. I didn't, um, I, we also made sure that every new member had a mentor and whether sometimes what happens is, you know, I think one year we had 14 members in like several months. How do you onboard 14 members to the Toastmasters program? So we had a nuts and bolts meeting is what we called it. So we basically invited all the new members. We went through the Toastmasters educational program and then we asked them if they wanted a mentor or we assigned a mentor to them for their first two, three speeches. Now, the mentor program didn't happen right away at, at, uh, at Genentech because we, we only had so, you know, so few members. But when we got 14 members, it was almost having a brand new club. And at that point, we tapped into um, the, the members that were still active and just asked them to help guide the new members through the process. And that worked out really well. So I think we had like three to one ratio, three new people to one season mentor. And that was, that was okay, especially if you're only talking to them through their first couple of projects. So the key thing that we did when we did our new member orientation was we talked about the Toastmaster educational system and we explained what it was and what it meant to be part of the district and to support the district. And then now we have pathways. So I would recommend that every new member should be walked through pathways because, you know, my husband recently joined Daily City Toastmasters and, um, you know, and since I was a Toastmaster, I had, I kind of walked him through it. But even for me, it's uh, because I'm still in the legacy system and trying to complete my DTM, it was a little confusing for me. So it might be confusing for the current officers to talk about pathways. And that's where we can tap into the re, uh, district for, the, for that learning. We have some pathways um, ambassadors and, and people that know what they're doing. And so I would just simply um, exchange phone numbers and ask them to contact them for any questions. The other thing that I, I realized about Pathways as I was learning it myself is I actually would call Toastmasters International and they would spend 20, 30, 40 minutes with me to make to go over Pathways until I understood it. Now the reason why I'm talking about um, this is scheduling is because the key to a healthy club is how your meetings are run. And how your meetings are run is going to really be dependent on, on your scheduling, on your VTE. So I recommend that uh, you have a published schedule one to three months out. I know that some clubs don't like that. They like to self-nominate or um, Genentech Toastmasters didn't like a published schedule. So when they were first chartered, everyone volunteered. So the meetings were, let's say, on Friday. So at the end of the Friday meeting, people would sign up for roles for the next Friday meeting. Well, that kind of works if you have a lot of members and it's pretty active. But what happened with Genentech is they went down to, they did some restructuring and we lost uh, more than half of our officer board and a majority of our membership. And um, scheduling on Fridays when nobody's showing up means there's no meetings the next Friday. So I, I think... At the, at, if, some, if, if a club is resistant to publish schedules, then do a hybrid. So for example, you have major roles assigned, Toastmasters, Speaker, Evaluations, Table Topics. The reason why you want those major roles assigned is you want to give them an opportunity to, to create and craft a really interesting and fun meeting. And so they need time to think about that and make sure that happens. Now the minor roles, to be saved for um, new members or can be assigned the day of the meeting, that's not a big deal. One of the things that I learned very early on as VPE, and that was 20 something years ago, was that there was a method to scheduling. So for example, you wanna, when someone signs up, you wanna have them do their icebreaker within the first two to four weeks for sure. So you wanna leave, um, 
some openings in your schedule for new members. And we had the recommended practice of, of uh, giving two speeches before we even assign someone an evaluator role. That gives them an opportunity to understand what, how a speech is developed and what to look for. And then their mentor will actually guide them through the evaluation process. And then I always like to schedule uh, someone as a table topics master before I schedule them as a toastmaster because table topics is like a mini meeting. So it's a uh, practice for segueing into different topics. And I believe that it's important that um, everyone fulfill all the major roles before they're assigned a general evaluator. Now these are just guidelines. I think that a club should strive for those when they're robust enough. And that's kind of like what the standard that I think people should try to shoot for. But you want to go with what's going to work for your club. Again, if someone who's never given a speech wants to be a Toastmaster, I would let them be, be the Toastmaster and just explain what that, what, what that role is. I think the other key thing about the clubs that I participated in is that we I did a lot of acknowledgments meaning every achievement was acknowledged, every milestone was acknowledged. We also um, applauded big things as well as small things. I want to talk about Elena. She was, I think, the best VPE that I have uh, had the fortunate grace to have worked with. She wasn't in my officer board, but I was a member. And I remember that she called me and said, Mayor, I just wanted to, I, you know, I was surprised you answered. I was going to leave you a voicemail. I just wanted to tell you um, what I liked about your evaluation today. And she gave me some pointers, uh, not pointers, but things that she really thought I did really well. And I have to tell you, on a personal level, that just moved me so much. And I have a very uh, soft, uh, big soft spot for Elena. And I think that when, when I was... Um, Vice President of Education and also as President, when I say you get to know your members, if our members were didn't come to the meeting, I would reach out and say, hey, I missed you the last couple of meetings. Are we going to see you again? Um, what's going on? We haven't seen you for a few months. Is everything okay? And I think that personal touch and that personal relationship is really the tie of what I was talking about being good friends. And I think ultimately people want to know that they make a difference. People want to know, hey, if, if I don't show up, someone's going to notice. They, may, they will more likely show up. If people feel, hey, nobody cares if I show up or not, and then they don't show up for two, three months, and then you start calling them during renewal time, um, there's no bond there. There's no glue that that ties their friendship. I think I spent a lot of time talking about how to schedule meetings and I think a well-run dynamic meeting is the best advertisement for the club. And having said that, sometimes meetings can be really a little too rigid and eventually it gets into a rut. Sometimes boring. Sometimes the same people keep speaking and uh, maybe new people feel like they can't speak or sometimes new people speak a lot and the more experienced dynamic speakers take a step back because they want the new members to have that platform. So I, the answer for that is uh, special meetings. I think special meetings really sparkle and invite people to participate. And when I talk about special meetings, I'm talking about holding a contest celebrating club anniversaries, you know, guest speakers and evaluations. And I'm talking about uh, members, uh, clubs now that are, that are in need of club coaches that, are, that don't have maybe enough membership to have a robust meeting. This is where you can tap into your area or even your division and your friendships to invite guest speakers. Um, I did that at Genentech. I met people at the division contest and at the division officer trainings, and then I invited them to be a guest speaker, a guest evaluator, um, and it worked out beautifully. 
there was a event I did called Toasty Afternoon, and it was actually a leadership project in a separate organization. I did that at, uh, I did it twice, one at Visa. At Visa, what it was, was it was tied into the 10 year anniversary. We went back and asked all chartering members to come back that were still at Visa. And at that time, uh, you know, companies, you stayed 15, 20, 30 years. It turned out that of the chartering members that were still at Visa, all of them were vice presidents or above. And that was just, a really wonderful acknowledgement of what the Toastmasters program could do so that these members that started this club are all vice presidents. Uh, we also had the best speakers um, redo or give an encore performance of their best speeches. So we had um, the chartering members come and visit and, and, and say, and one VP said a few words, then we had um, our members, the best of our best, come and give a, a, an um, encore performance of some of, of their best talk. And then we had coffee and cake, and, and that was really enjoyable. And it really showed, we had like 65 people attend, and that was fantastic. At Genentech, uh, I used the theme toast, uh, coffee talk, not toasty afternoon, but coffee talk. And that was my HPL project, and what I did was have a speaker series. So we invited professional level speakers to come to Genentech and speak. We gave, um, we provided cake and coffee, and I, I think that the first speech we had 175 members show up. And then, you know, as the as the speaker series went on, I think the lowest membership we had was um, 75 attendants, which is still pretty good. Another thing about special meetings are open houses. And open houses are basically when you make an announcement either in your internal site or if your corporate club allows other members to come, you make an announcement, you open your club up for people to come and visit. And you usually have like a, a abbreviated meeting, sort of like a demo meeting, so people can ask questions and participate. And then you invite them back to a normal meeting so they can really see what that looks like. One of the interesting things that's been happening at Genentech is that um, other departments are reaching out to our Genentech club to see if we will facilitate um, off-sites and special meetings. So several of our club members have had the opportunity and wanted the opportunity to, to to develop a seminar, develop some sort of tech training, and then they facilitated that process. I think uh, departments of 30 to um, 100 or so. So those are really, in fact, one of our uh, members who left our club, but he went on to facilitate something called the Awesome Forum. Forum. In the Awesome Forum, they have um, in, in, invite leaders to give talks that they craft themselves. But the whole process is three to four months where they meet with them and help them figure out their talk and present their talk. And then they spend half a day giving these, um, these presentations and these talks and their leadership perspective. And, and it's been amazingly successful. And they call that the Awesome Forum in my company. So I never actually focused on the Distinguished Club Program in my entire time as an officer. I always focused on the process. Because if you have the club environment correct, if you are reaching out to new members and making sure they're being supportive, and your members, your new members eventually become, you want to retain them as seasoned members, so you want to give them opportunities to continue developing their skills. So I've always thought of the DCP as really a temperature check. So educational achievements indicate that members are winning at their goals, and then the dues, the officer list, and the officer training points that you get shows a committed and organized board. So if a club is on point, um, they should naturally automatically get 
a distinguished desi club designation just because they're doing the right things and they have the right environment. I know that's a radical thought for some for some of us. Um, when you start getting to select distinguished and presidents distinguished, I think that when you're rebuilding your club, you just want to focus on the process, make sure the process is correct, because then you will naturally become distinguished. And then once you're distinguished, then you can start looking at doing the more, you know, advanced things of achieving select distinguished and president's distinguished. <laughs> so this is my fun slide. These are all my favorite movies. And I realized that movies are like great clubs. People are willing to stand in line to get in. So there are some clubs that I heard in San Francisco where there's a wait list to, to, to participate. And so whatever level your club is at, whatever membership level, meaning amount of members you have in your club, if you have a, a standard and you expect your members to have that standard, it's a privilege to be a member of this club. And with that membership comes expectations. And just like when we go to the movies, we expect to see a great movie. When we spend our time in our Toastmasters club, we want to have a great meeting and be around great people. And again, I'm going to just emphasize that um, Sparkle attracts new members. So this slide was up there earlier for special meetings, but that's really where you want to target how you get your new members is having some unusual meetings. Um, another thing that's not listed in here is uh, speech crafts and um, seminars that you can give to the public that you can attract people to attend your meetings. And of course, there's practical things like advertising on Meetup and Eventbrite and things like that. The other thing that I want to say is, you know, rebuilding a club can be fun. It doesn't have to be all work or stress. Um, when I was uh, coaching uh, e-communicators, which is the Walmart Club in San Bruno, um, I recommended that they get HR alignment and funding. And Tasha Ford, and I have to give her a shout out, I had not ever seen this done before and I was amazed that she pulled it off. She started what was called, what she called a Toastmaster Advisory Board or TAB. So what that was is she met with senior leaders with the VP of HR and, and they would discuss Toastmasters and how to grow Toastmasters and she showed the value of like how affordable it was to put their people through the Toastmasters organization for communication and leadership development, that it was a hundred something dollars for the whole year. I have to say that club grew and became distinguished in less than a year, specifically because of this TAB, uh, Toastmaster Advisory Board. And what made that brilliant is that it allowed the officers to be in front of senior leaders and, and make a difference in their culture, in their Walmart culture, in their organization. Um, now, again, you know, as all things happen, the VP that supported Toastmasters left. And so that shouldn't be something that should be disheartened because when you get support in one, from one VP in one organization, you can get support from another VP in a, in a different organization, meaning that I was able to get funding from Genentech, for Genentech Toastmasters because we got funding from Visa Toastmasters. So why would HR at Visa give us 2500 and and not Genentech Toastmasters? And Genentech uh, HR gave us 4000 And I think uh, there are clubs out there that get five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a year. But the one thing that we were always um, cognizant of is showing value for the funding we get. That's why we support the district. That's why we... Um, try to make sure that we fund officer training. Uh, if people can, uh, can't afford to go to the district conference, we'll pay those tickets. That's what the, the funds are. So the funds for, for our club are 
to go for educational materials and occasionally uh, food, but the majority of it is to go for, um, you know, club contests. Um, now, um, it's very easy to get corporate HR funding. I know people think it's hard, but it's actually very easy to get corporate funding. And if you need help with that, reach out to me privately and I can show you what the process. But basically the process is you knock on the door, you show them how much Toastmasters cost, and then you compare it with other training that's available for communication and leadership. Then you give them a list of well-renowned Toastmasters that are very successful and then you ask them for a set amount of money and then you tell them what you're going to use the money for. Most, in most organizations will actually fund Toastmasters now, I think, because they're looking for more affordable ways of training their staff. So the beauty of Toastmasters is that you know, it's a brown bag lunch. People can bring their own lunch. They spend their hour coming to a Toastmasters meeting, usually if it's a corporate club. And um, and I have found, in my experience, um, I help e-commerce get dot uh, com. Sorry, e-commerce dot com. The Walmart club get funding, um, and I was we were able to do that simply because we. We pressed upon precedents, meaning there, there's a precedent in place for corporate clubs to get funding or a professional development organization. But if you need help with that, let me know, and I can, um, I can walk you through that process. So your club is going to grow. You put in the culture. You put in the correct scheduling. You create dynamic meetings, you advertise appropriately in your company intranet, uh, and if they allow outside members wherever you can advertise, your club will grow. You will attract new members. Now, with that new membership, they're signing up because of something you promised them. You promised them self-development. You promised them a great culture. You promised them um, that they have a place and that it's safe for them to to grow in your organization. So in return for that, I believe that new members have to also make some promises. I've seen a decline in voting members in. So we voted members in at Visa. We don't do that at Genentech. I recently joined another club in San Francisco, Evening Stars, and I had to be voted in as a member. And I was shocked, but you know, it made me made sense because one of the tenets of of voting in new members is it it formalizes the membership process. So the actual cost to join is so inexpensive. Some people don't take that seriously. Oh, it's only hundred bucks or only two hundred dollars, whatever the fee is for your club. In the bigger scheme of things, when you look at a Anthony Robbins, a Tony Robbins training that's three five thousand dollars, you know, two or three hundred dollars, that's a really nice dinner. So when you vote new members in, it sets the tone that says, okay, we're, we're serious about our club where we feel that we're going to the win, one of the best clubs in the district. And so we want those type of members that will also be committed to supporting our club. So if you vote them in, if someone is not complying with the program, the program being, you know, creating a great environment where everybody feels safe and no one feels threatened, then you have the opportunity to vote them out. Um, I've never seen that happen, but it's nice to know that that's your out card or your get out of free jail card. Now, I also believe in new member inductions because here's the thing about rebuilding your club. You have an opportunity to have a brand new club and it depends on how you Orient, orientate your new members. So when you do a new member induction ceremony, every new member can't say, hey, I didn't know I was supposed to show up because the new member induction ceremony sets a standard and they're promising that they're going to fulfill their membership and that membership is a privilege and it shouldn't be taken for granted. 
And starting over is fine as long as everyone is starting at the same point. So if your club has not done a new member, so our recently Genentech fell out of that practice, and so I requested we should have new member induction. So we went back and anybody that wasn't inducted in, as a new member, we, we, we did a ceremony and they were surprised. They said, I didn't know I was supposed to do these because we made them also read the Toastmasters promise. And don't take, see this is what I mean about putting things back in the process of following the Toastmasters, Toastmasters International Educational Process. Because the things that they have in place are in place for a reason. And so when you, re, when you forego a new member induction, when you forego um, you know, orienting a new mem orientating a new member, then you forego maybe they may, may not have even read the Toastmasters promise. So they don't understand that these are their expectations, that they're supposed to attend club meetings regularly and they're supposed to prepare their projects to the best abilities and not, you know, read a manual and then present it the same day. So these are these little things, this Toastmaster promise, if all the members followed them, actually contributes to great culture and a great club because the meetings will be uh, on point. They'll usually have a theme, an agenda. So all these best practices are, and the sense of pride of being part of the club is instilled in the new members. And they want to maintain that standard that you set. And it's never too late to set a standard. It's never too late to create your culture. It's never too late to publish meaning. These best practices, if you and what happens is clubs grow, they get successful, you know, officers leave, different commitments come in, and so sometimes the best practices fall to the wayside. Genentech's always pretty much been at 50. I think right now we're at maybe 35, 40, which is a drop for us. We haven't been there for, for a while. Now 50 works for our organization because of people's travel schedules and the workload. Um, but again, we weren't doing new member induction ceremony. And I share that not as a, a criticism, but just like it's natural. When things start getting successful too, when you start growing, things break down. So the, the, the things that got you to that 20, 30, 40, 50, people stop following those process and they kind of get into maybe some bad habits. And then that's where, that's where you want to watch out for. The, the little things you think don't really make a difference, but in the long run, they do. So I'm going to stop here at the Toastmasters Promise. Here's the reference list of where I got my pictures. This is my favorite leadership uh, book. And then this is the slide deck for the next webinar that's coming up, Club Sponsors and Club Mentors. I'm going to pause here and see if there's any questions that we can answer in the next five to ten minutes. So this is, uh, thank you, Mayor. For the question and answer, this is how we're going to do it. If you have any questions, please type it into the um, chat window and you would see the questions typed in by everyone else and Mar can as well see the questions typed by you and she will take it as it comes. Now while we are waiting for others to type in their questions, Mar first of all can you see the chat window now? No, you have to make yourself the presenter and remove me. Okay, so uh, I thought I did. Okay, so let me, yeah, so you're not the present anymore, and I, ho I thought you should be able to see the uh, chat window. So if you don't, I can read it for you. Okay, I got a question from Terry. Yeah. I love the point of new member inductions. Mayor, what are your thoughts on how to set expectations with potential members even before they become new members? Well, you know, what we do is, is actually our vice president of membership, or in the past, they have that, so you want to be a member. Um, let me explain our application process. Um, 
I don't know, Terry, if that answered your question, but it's really just having a conversation and saying, just wanted to share with you our culture, how we do things, and then, um, and then when they decide they, so for me, I'm going to backtrack. So for me, a member should be so hot to join, like so excited to join. Like you have to pull them on a leash. Like I've been talking about Toastmasters to my husband um, for 15 years. But then when he was ready to join, he, he joined that day. And, um, and it was really the people at Daily City Toastmasters that made him feel very included and accepted and safe. So if you focus on the culture, it doesn't really matter. Members will just live up to the standard you set for them. So I don't know if you uh, guys heard me. Uh, answer your question, Terry. Terry, could you could you please? Yeah, uh, I I hear I see Terry say yes, thanks. Okay. Uh, do we have any more questions? If you do, please chat. Uh, type it into the chat window. While we are waiting for that, Matt, could you please uh, confirm that you can see my desktop with the poster for the upcoming webinar on 22nd I, of October? I can. Okay. And um, and I'm looking, and Terry, I think, is uh, presenting as well, right, with Aubrey? Yeah. So that was, uh, you know, after the question and answer session, I was planning to promote this, but then since it doesn't look like we have any more questions, First of all, thank you all for joining. And there is another webinar coming up in less than two weeks. This is on 22nd of October, same time, 6.30 to 7.30, same channel, same everything. But you need to go register because it actually will send a new email with a new registration link. And this is about club sponsors and club mentors. It will be done by two of our distinguished uh, colleagues from District 4. Club sponsor part would be covered by our past district director, Aubrey Carrier. And this will be followed by the club mentor part, which will be done by Terry Joyce. So please do join and please do register. And if you think you know the um, uh, details of this, still try to join or at least help us promote this webinar, tell your colleagues about it. It could be a person from another district. It's okay. Let's promote our district and the programs we have and let's learn from each other. And since it looks like we don't have any more questions, thank you all. Thank you, Matt, for the wonderful uh, webinar. I wish you all a great night. Thank you.